Is nuclear winter a real threat? And what about the the, the second order effects, like on you know nuclear uh, power plants and stuff like that? How would that fit into the calculus of a of a nuclear strike? Uh, I think nuclear winter is largely a myth. Anything is possible, okay? But nuclear winter was basically invented. Uh, well, if you go all the way back, because I remember being on the ground floor of the great debates over nuclear winter during the Cold War. <clears throat> nuclear winter started off as an argument by Carl Sagan to drum up money for NASA. You know, and he wanted to prove uh, the, a- after the moon landings, there was a lot less public enthusiasm for space travel. And so NASA, uh, uh, Sagan decided to jump into an area that was popular, which was the nuclear freeze movement the anti-nuclear movement, and to, and to say, well, you know, you know, you look at these icy planets uh, and the uh, ecological effects that you have, and uh, we can learn things that are relevant to the United States, like the possibility of a nuclear winter happening if there's a nuclear war. And so it started off as a propaganda exercise, you know, to try to increase the budget for NASA. That was Carl Sagan's objective. But of course, it quickly became embraced by the anti-nuclear left. Uh, because they like to argue that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought because it would be the end of the world. And nuclear winter is one of the devices they have used for making that case. But I don't think the science supports the likelihood of a nuclear winter. Their argument is is that if you had a large-scale use of nuclear weapons, it would burn down lots of forests and cities would get burned down. We just talked about the reasons why they wouldn't be targeting cities, but that there would be enough... uh, a particular matter put into the atmosphere that it would block out the sun and uh, and start a climatological change in the earth that would in effect cause a winter, a deep freeze. The models that predict a nuclear winter are rigged to result in that outcome. If you tweak a few variables, you get a very different outcome. And we know, we actually have objective data uh, that suggests that nuclear winter is a myth. You know, there was a time when we were doing atmospheric nuclear testing, you know, all through the 50s uh, and into the early 60s. We did atmospheric nuclear testing. We, we sent off, we detonated enough megatonnage in the atmosphere, you know, during the 50s and 60s that it would be the equivalent of a nuclear war today. And we didn't have any hint of a nuclear winter resulting from those uh, atmospheric explosions. We saw, we've also had the experience uh, with volcanoes that put enormous amounts of particulate matter. Krakatoa, for example, you know, is probably one of the biggest volcanic explosions in history. And uh, it did not cause a nuclear winter. It did cause more attractive sunsets in the 1880s. We have Mount St. Helens go off in this country, you know, put enormous amounts of uh, particulate matter. But you can look at the history of volcanology, see the equivalent of many nuclear wars, quote unquote, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the thermal effects and the particulate effects from uh, from these, and there's n- never been anything like a nuclear winter that has resulted. So I really don't think the science for nuclear winter is uh, is good. I think it's a myth. And it's certainly a myth when it comes to things like EMP, you know, which doesn't burn anything. Uh, you know, it basically is a counter electronic uh, attack. The collateral effects from, a, from an EMP, as you described, are, are real. Although, if the Russians were going to do an EMP attack on European NATO, they wouldn't have to worry about the field reaching all the way to Russia. You know, they'd probably detonate a weapon. I mean, we did, we did a, a scenario, we did the calculations on the EMP commission and uh, detonated a super EMP warhead. 70 kilometers high over Brussels, which is where NATO headquarters were located. And this would black out electric grids from Ireland all the way to Poland. But the field, the, the damage would stop basically, you know, within European NATO. Uh, it wouldn't reach uh, Russia. Uh, and the Russians would be counting on these collateral effects that you're describing, like raising hob with nuclear power plants, because they want to put our political and military leaders pose them with a dilemma. What do we do? Do we now engage in a war with Russia that we're going to lose because 
because we can't do anything because our critical infrastructures and our military systems are paralyzed? Or do we take what little still works in the West and go and stop uh, you know, catastrophes from happening at the nuclear power plants? Get the water works running again so people have water. Save the food so that people don't start starving to death. Uh, you know, any political leader who cares about his people should be make, making that decision. And they'd be saying, okay, whatever aggression the Russians are committing in Central Asia or wherever they are, they're going to get away with it, at least for the time being, because I've got to focus on saving my own people, on restoring my critical infrastructure so we don't have millions of people dying here in the West. So they actually count, you're right, there would be collateral effects. And the bad guys are counting on those collateral effects to get us to decide to, to, to stay out of a war, to stay out of an act of aggression that they commit. One of the myths that's widespread, has been around forever, uh, you know, is nuclear radioactivity, fallout. That's one of the things that people fear about nuclear war most of all is the, uh, is the radioactive fallout. And so you'll find the left arguing that, well, okay, uh, even if you don't believe in nuclear winter, what about that nuclear fallout? That's real. And so if you have a large scale nuclear war, the whole world is going to die because nuclear fallout is eventually going to spread everywhere and kill everybody. Well, that didn't happen during the 50s and early 60s. You know, uh, we did explode very many megatons worth of, uh, of fissionable materials in the atmosphere. And we eventually went underground because we knew it wasn't healthy. But we, in effect, fought the equivalent of a nuclear war, you know, by those detonations. And it, and it did not kill the whole world. Uh, you know, by, by any means. Moreover, uh, the fallout effects are greatly exaggerated because you get the most fallout if you're thinking about a worst case scenario where the bad guys actually attack cities. That's not what they're going to do, at least certainly not initially. They're going to want to attack your military forces, like the hardened ICBM silos. You don't get any fallout from a nuclear weapon, or you get very little when it's detonated at the optimum burst height to generate a blast wave on the ground. The fireball has to be in contact with the ground in order to cause radioactive fallout. Because what's happening, you see the, all the megatonnage of the bomb, all the yield of the bomb is not radioactive. It's only the fission component, which is plutonium uranium. Only that small part is gonna cause the radioactivity. And as I briefly explained earlier, in order to make an H-bomb go off, you need a small A-bomb to go off. And this is called the trigger. And these are typically five kilotons in yield. You know, a, a good designer can make a trigger that's one kiloton in yield. You know, this is one twentieth the size of the Hiroshima bomb. And when the fireball comes in contact with the ground, you know, it sucks up sand and, uh, and material from the surface of the earth. And it gives the, the plutonium and the uranium that has not fissioned something to hook onto. So you get a little deadly plutonium or uranium particle attached to that piece of dust. And this dust will go everywhere. And that's what the radioactive fallout is. And if a cow eats it and it goes into your milk, you know, I mean, it can enter into your, your bones and, and kill people with cancers in the long run. Or if you're in a hot spot that's extremely intense with radiation. But a counterforce attack isn't going to work that way. The fireball is probably not going to come in contact with the ground under most scenarios because you want the the, the detonation height to be high enough to optimize the radius of the blast on the ground. So when you're going after bomber bases or missile silos or submarine ports, you know, the fireball is going to be up there in the atmosphere and not in contact with the surface of the ground. So there would be little or no fallout in a counterforce attack. Uh, in a counterforce attack, we are trying to destroy the enemy's forces. Uh, you know, you're trying to optimize the radius of the blast on the ground, and it's called the optimum burst height. Most circumstances, the optimum burst height is going to be high enough so that fireball doesn't come anywhere near to being on the ground and create fallout. And with the Russians, they probably have, looking at their scientific literature and a lot of their claims, they probably have pure fusion weapons at this point. Not all of them, but some of them, you know, uh, which generate no fallout at all. Certainly, uh, as their design uh, has improved, I mean, they're 30 years ahead of us now in nuclear weapons design, you know, they've, I'm sure they've gotten better and better at reducing the fission yield, the size of the fission trigger 
that's needed to set off a thermonuclear weapon. And so that makes the weapons cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And, uh, and so that's why the fallout myth, while well, fallout is real, fallout is a real danger to people, but the likelihood that you're gonna have a nuclear scenario where everybody in the world dies from nuclear fallout is, is unlikely. I'd be far more concerned about a scenario where the bad guys decide that they won't accept our surrender. And, uh, you know, and they decide that they're just going to eliminate us and, and attack our cities anyway and take the hit on their cities as well. That's a possibility. Possibility of these things escalating out of control to that highest level. A totalitarian state, because of their strategic culture, might well do something like that. You know, uh, uh, and I'd be far more concerned about that. All the more reason for us to be, to be focusing on defenses. I mean, the, tr the way out of this uh, is, and well, again, the left is the obstacle, the very solution. They say that they are, they claim the moral high ground and, and despise people like me because they say, oh, you people that think about fighting nuclear war, you're evil, okay? They're on the moral high ground because they think that a nuclear war can't be fought and won. I say they are not on the moral high ground because they're actually making the very war that they claim they want to avoid more likely by leaving us unprepared to deter it. And uh, I think they especially sacrifice their moral integrity when they oppose defenses, when they oppose civil defenses, when they oppose the new technologies, for example, that Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative came up with. You know, we can get out of this dilemma. Uh, one of the things I wish we, the Biden administration would be focusing on, and I've advocated this in my articles, is making nuclear weapons obsolete by surpassing them with a superior military technology. I mean, historically, it's not treaties that end up retiring, you know, terrible weapons. It's that you come up with a better weapon, you know, and that better weapon can actually be a more humane weapon. And this is what the Strategic Defense Initiative was about. It was focused not on attacking cities and holding populations hostage, but destroying the weapons of mass destruction themselves, attacking them in space, attacking them in the boost phase, mid phase, and then the reentry vehicles themselves. So you're not destroying people, you're destroying the adversary's attempt to attack you. Uh, there was a system called Brilliant Pebbles. It's not true. That's another myth the left likes to perpetuate that this so-called Star Wars or Strategic Defense Initiative produced no useful technology and that it's impossible to hit a bullet with a bullet. Well, Israel proves every day that it's possible to hit a bullet with a bullet with their Iron Dome system. And we proved during the Persian Gulf War that you can hit a bullet with a bullet. Uh, you know, uh, but we came up with a system for strategic weapons called Brilliant Pebbles, which would have been very cost effective. We could still deploy this system. It would take $20 billion and five years probably to deploy it. And it would protect us against Russia, China, North Korea, against anything they wanted to throw at us. And, uh, uh, and it would be a good thing if, if the Russians and Chinese wanted to compete with us and deploy their own Brilliant Pebbles system. In fact, Ronald Reagan actually was going to share the Strategic Defense Initiative technology with, with, with the Soviet Union and with our adversaries, because it becomes a good thing when you have an arms race over defensive systems. It makes all sides feel get safer and safer and makes the likelihood of an offensive war less and less likely. Right now, when we really need to do this, because right now, in large measure, because of the efforts of the left that have suppressed defensive systems, you know, the technologies that are being developed favor the attacker, they favor the aggressor. They, they are pushing us technologically towards scenarios where, uh, where it's gonna become irresistible to launch a nuclear Pearl Harbor. You know, these, just take one example, these hypersonic warheads, you know, we can't see them. Uh, you know, they evade our radars. Uh, our ground-based defenses are grossly inadequate to deal with them. The only way we could really neutralize them is with space-based defenses. We could, within our lifetimes, make nuclear missiles obsolete if we just had the political will to do it. The technology is there to do it. Yeah. It's the politics of, uh, uh, of this. And the opposition to it is mostly coming from these 
anti-nuclear activists who mistakenly think a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Nuclear wars can be won, and they are going to be fought if we don't think about how to stop them. And how substantial is the Russian development of the Sarmat 2 system and their S-5, I believe it's the S-550 missile defense system? How significant are these advances in the uh, nuclear strategy? Well, the Sarmat is one of the super weapons that Putin threatened us with a few years ago. And it's supposed to start coming online soon. And it's an example of the very technology that I was just describing. It's a, it's a, a wonder weapon from the point of view of an aggressor of, of, of doing nuclear Pearl Harbors. It's what we call a heavy ICBM. Only in Russia has got heavy ICBMs. They're called heavy ICBMs because they have such tremendous throw weight. You know, they can throw 20 tons or more of, of warheads at you. The smallest number I think I've seen attributed to the Sarmat is 15 warheads on one, on one missile. You could put possibly 40 or 50 warheads on that one missile. But let's take, let's suppose there's only 10 warheads on the Sarmat, 10 warheads. You know, you only need 500 weapons to do a counterforce attack to destroy our ICBMs, our bombers, our ballistic missile submarines in their port, and to take out a few key command and control nodes, 500 warheads. Only 50 of these Sarmats could deliver all 500 of those warheads, just 50 out of all, all, all their missiles. And, and the Chinese are developing a, a similarly threatening ICBM right now. It's called the DF-41. They actually have mobile versions of the DF-41. But uh, we think these 350 to 400 silos they're building out are all going to be for DF-41s. You know, so they're going to have thousands of weapons that can do what the SARMAC, you know, uh, can do. The offensive capabilities of these, of these systems are so great. I think that the Russians and Chinese may already have written us off. Uh, you know, why are they deploying thousands and thousands of these first strike weapons? And they only need 500 against the United States. I think they might be looking toward World War IV against each other, that they know that at some point when the United States is eclipsed, you know, that they're going to go against each other, you know, for struggle for the control of the world, which is one of the reasons why I'm also hopeful that we could possibly achieve a peace. And, and, and I have advocated for that because I think Putin knows that in the long run, China is a bigger threat to Russia than the West. It may seem possible to imagine a strategic partnership right now between Russia and the United States, but who would have imagined the strategic partnership between uh, Germany and Japan in 1945 and that they would become our, our greatest allies today? We have to look into the far future, too, and decide, you know, who's the biggest threat to us? Is it Russia or is it China? I think on balance, China is the country that needs to be isolated. And they are the biggest, uh, the biggest threat. Uh, I think Putin and, and, and Xi are already looking at that future nuclear chessboard. Uh, you know, they are temporary allies. Uh, you know, but in the long run, I, I, I think they are almost on the verge of writing the West off, you know, because we have so neglected our nuclear capabilities. And, and, and a future war will be one with the most powerful technology on the battlefield at the time. And today that is nuclear weapons. I've, I've, just, I've described ways we can salvage that. We can turn that around with the de defensive weapons, but oh, right now we're, I'm not hopeful that we're gonna move in that direction. So, certainly not under this administration. Yeah, and in the case with Germany and Japan, I mean, obviously we had to defeat them for us to become allies. You know, perhaps the same would would have to be true with Russia in the sense that they would have to be defeated somehow. Many high-ranking officials within the Russian government have explicitly stated that uh, the trust between Europe and the United States and Russia no longer exists and that these relationships will be uh, hampered for decades now. So it's likely that you know we, we can't put the genie back into the bottle, so to speak. I have infinite faith in the self-interest of nations, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it may not seem plausible now, but it's just uh, when you think of how uh, of the hatreds that existed at the end of the World War II, you know, between Japan and Germany, 
how plausible was it that within five years, you know, suddenly they would become our best friends, you know? It's true. Anything, anything is definitely possible. You're, you're right. In terms of uh, EMP weapons, we touched on that last time a little bit. Uh, I just wanted you to expound a bit more on the difference between a super EMP weapon and a standard EMP weapon. 